Unless you learn languages from under a rock, you've probably heard about the Duolingo controversy. Last month, the CEO announced he was making the company AI first, and replacing contract workers with AI where possible. This provoked a huge backlash from users, whose illusion of Duolingo as a friendly, meme -y brand was suddenly shattered. In the cold light of day, Duolingo is a for-profit company beholden to its shareholders in a harshly competitive capitalist economy. And after that revelation, the fun memes feel kind of patronising and cynical. But while much of the criticism has focused on AI replacing human workers, there's also another side to the backlash. Many users have noticed that Duolingo's AI content might not be ready for prime time, with popular YouTuber Evan Edinger calling it AI slop. So what prompted the company to make this change? Part of the answer may lie in research conducted by Duolingo and published in February this year, less than three months before the announcement. The paper describes two studies in which users of Duolingo's AI features were asked about their so-called self-efficacy, basically their confidence in their own ability to use the language they're learning. These studies had a combination of flaws that severely limit the strength of the conclusions you should draw from them. There was no control group, and the study designs were vulnerable to both selection bias and survivorship bias, as well as weaknesses in the statistical methods. In World War II, the Center of Naval Analyses conducted a study which measured which parts of military aircraft had sustained the most damage from enemy fire. They initially wanted to add armor to the areas that sustained the most damage. This is an understandable and intuitive first instinct, but it turned out to be the exact opposite of the correct conclusion. Hungarian mathematician Abraham Wald had the insight that this study only included aircraft that had survived their missions. Aircraft that sustained catastrophic damage were lost. So what the study was really measuring is what parts of the aircraft can take damage without the aircraft being destroyed. So the correct response was to armor the parts of the aircraft that showed the least damage. This is a great example of survivorship bias. A logical error where focusing only on samples that have survived can lead to the wrong conclusions. In the Duolingo studies, users were asked to fill out a survey at the beginning and the end, but they were excluded if they didn't meet the minimum usage requirements set by the researchers. This effectively weeds out any users who disliked the new features and didn't want to use them. They only end up measuring the users who liked the new features enough to use them consistently. So the results will of course be more positive than if they'd included everyone. In the first study, a staggering 40% of participants were eliminated this way. This problem was exacerbated by the study's lack of a control group. It's reasonable to expect that active language learners will improve their confidence in the language over time, with or without the AI features. So what gives the researchers the idea that these improvements are linked with the features? The study is carefully worded so as not to claim causation, but I'd argue that it doesn't even show correlation. The researchers could have given the same surveys to another group of users who don't have access to the AI features. This would allow for comparison between the two groups, establishing a causative link if one exists. But the researchers only showed that users given the AI features improved their confidence, which should be expected unless the AI somehow actively harms their confidence. A control group would also help with the survivorship bias issue. While it wouldn't eliminate the problem, it would at least reveal whether attrition is higher with or without the AI features. So those are by far the biggest problems with the study, so I'll just go over the others quickly. They only included moderately active iOS users learning Spanish or French in English-speaking countries. That might not be representative of the whole user base. They initially included 17 questions in the surveys, but only analysed the seven most relevant ones. We just have to trust that they didn't peek at this data first to decide what to include, which could constitute p-hacking and invalidate the data analysis. They converted a six-point scale into just agree or disagree, which throws away any changes in the magnitude of the agreement or disagreement. The participants were paid $40 to complete the study, which creates extrinsic motivation to use the features that wouldn't exist for regular users. To be clear, I'm not remotely anti-AI. Hell, I created my own app Squeno that helps you leverage AI to learn languages in a convenient, relaxed and engaging way. Let's use the Squeno browser to read an article about the Duolingo controversy in my target language of Japanese. The article is too advanced for me to understand without help, so let's turn on Squeno. The webpage has now been simplified to my level of Japanese, and if there are any words I don't understand, I could just tap them to see translations. I could also listen to the text to see how things are pronounced. 
Alternatively, I can choose from over a thousand free pre-made stories based on scenarios, classic tales and current news. These stories scale with your level and have all the same helpful features as the browser. To get a free trial of the browsing features and unlimited access to the stories, go to squeno.com or click the link in the description. So clearly I have nothing against AI, but I think that the mistake Duolingo made was misjudging their users' sentiment about AI, and I think it's likely that putting too much stock in the results of this study has steered them in the wrong direction. But as a final caveat, Duolingo shares haven't gone down in value since the backlash. They've actually gone up. Do the markets know better than me? Maybe the backlash is from a loud, AI-hating minority, and most Duolingo users don't actually care. If so, all this publicity could be a benefit. What do you think about the whole thing? Let me know in the comments below. Don't forget to like the video, and please subscribe if you're interested in hearing more from me. And after subscribing, hit that bell icon as well. That will make sure that you get a notification when I upload a new video. And by the way, the all-knowing YouTube AI has picked out this video just for you, so make sure you give that a watch too. See you in the next one.